This is Carol Merritt on Thursday, April the 20th, 2006 at the Atlanta History Center talking this morning with Ernest Swan. Good morning, Mr. Swan. Good morning, Carol. Thank you for coming to share with us your experience, your experiences of growing up in Atlanta, your experiences in your family, and uh, particularly your, your father and your family's involvement in the whole school desegregation issue. What I'd like to do, first of all, is just ask you to uh, tell me something about yourself, where you were born, uh, who your parents were. Uh, born November 14, 1947, in, here in Atlanta, Georgia. And as soon as you mentioned it, I was trying to remember the name of that itty-bitty hospital over off... Harris? Harris, Harris Hospital, that's it. Um, at that time, we were living on Thurman Street in a duplex with uh, my grandmother and one of my father's brothers. Who was your grandmother? My grandmother was Josie Swan. She was from Covington. Um, I knew I got to I got to know her, but my grandfather Will Swan passed in the 1940s, so mm -hmm. I never got to meet him. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I only saw one picture of him. Um, okay. Later on in Daddy's life, we were talking about him, and I found out he was a florist. I never knew that, but he always wore a carnation and a derby in his okay. photos. Um, not much. Daddy didn't talk much about him um, because he passed while Dad was in the army. Okay. Um, what was the names of your parents? My parents, um, Ralph and Ernestine Swan. Okay. My mother's formerly Ernestine Dobbs from Villarica, Georgia. Okay. My dad was a native Atlanta, and Will Swan was also a native Atlanta. Okay. Um, I have a brother, Charles, and a sister, Dory. Okay. Um, uh, Are they older or younger than you? Younger. I'm the oldest. Oh, okay. I'm the oldest. Mm -hmm. My brother just turned 55. I'll be 59 this year. Okay. And my sister will be 54. Okay. Um, Daddy, I have memories of Daddy, younger days. He used to work at um, Fort Gillum when mm -hmm. he came back from the service. The first, first job he had when he came back from the service was working at Saul Cohen Bicycle Shop in West End. The what? Saul Cohen. Saul Cohen. S-O-L. C-O-H-E-N. Saul, C -O -H -E -N. Saul uh -huh. Cohen Bicycle in West End. Okay. And what was he doing there? He just they just repaired they just repaired and sold bicycles. Okay. You know, in the forties that was a major mode of transportation for people who couldn't afford gas. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember Dad telling me one time that he thought that the automobiles were never going to really catch on because they were <laughs> too expensive and bicycles were going to be the, the mode of transportation. He was his, his intent. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when he when part of he used his veterans benefits to get a tube kit so that he'd be able to work on bicycles and solve cars. Okay. Um, I guess this being about the color line, one of the, one of the members I remember him saying about was um, the white employees at the bicycle shop were jealous because of his new tube kit and they eventually stole it. Uh -huh. uh, Daddy left Saul Cohen and got a job at Fort Gill. I uh, don't know what he did. Uh -huh. He had been in the army, though, right? Yes, You're saying, yes, okay. He spent. Um, you know, back in those days, you just stayed until the war was over. Mm -hmm. He, uh, as a matter of fact, that's how he met my mom. Okay. He came home on leave. One of his um, army mates, my uncle Charles, they found out they were both from the same general area. And being a veteran myself, I know how you tend to gravitate towards someone from your own hometown. Okay. And uncle Charles, and he came home leave and they went to Villarica and that's where he met my mother. Okay. Um, he was oh, he was 24, mm -hmm. 20, 21, 24, somewhere around there. Uh-huh. And mom was 12. Oh, okay. So needless to say But he knew back then? He didn't know well when he came when he came home after the service that's what he knew but he remembered that uh -huh. sweet little girl Mom came from a big family, and they were farmers. Okay. 
And so everyone had to go work the fields, including my Uncle Charles, who was home on leave. So mom, being the baby of the family, stayed in the house to cook. So okay. she kept him company ah. while they were out working the fields. And he okay. remember they played blackjack, uh, not blackjack, the ball and the jacks. You know, uh, they, jacks. Jacks, yeah, uh -huh. they played jacks. And, but, uh, and she talks, talks a lot. <laughs> but anyway, he went back and um, it's, it's funny how the relationship grew. <clears throat> when my grandfather passed, dad was in his army overseas, mm -hmm. and my grandmother mm -hmm. and the family made a decision not to tell him, because mm -hmm. they figured it would, might affect his performance in the war. Right. So he didn't know his father had passed mm -hmm. until a cousin wrote him a letter expressing sympathy mm -hmm. about the death of his father, and daddy got upset with the family for not telling him, and he just cut off all communication with him. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, I inherited that. Sometimes we do hold a grudge, and we get angry, <laughs> we hold a grudge. Mm -hmm. But um, Uncle Charles, feeling sorry because Dad wouldn't get any mail, asked my mother, who was then maybe 13, 14, to just write it. And they started writing back and forth, all while he was in the service for five years. Okay, so she reached adulthood. She had graduated from high school and was now living in Atlanta when he came home from the military. Very interesting. And that's when he started dating. Mm -hmm. Two years later, they got married. No, they got married in 1945. They, that same year, they got married in 1945. Okay. The same year. Okay. Um, Mom worked, um, she was a bellhop. At, a bellhop? You know, in the elevator. Okay. For Davis's. Oh, so that's what they call that. Yeah. Okay. Instead of the person standing, they, they just ran the elevator and they, mom talks in her sleep. She talks and that she, much. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. But um, she used to have to announce the floors and what was, you know, what Oh, was I remember the elevator the operators. Elevator. Yeah. So she would talk all night long in her sleep announcing floors. <laughs> and uh, like I say, dad worked at the bicycle shop and then the, um, went on to work at um, Fort Gillum. And after the war, he was not sure of the, how much longer they were going to you know, be working since they were actually working on military mm -hmm. stuff. But he, we bought our first house. We moved to 2172 Tellhurst Street, right behind Westview Cemetery. In Tellhurst, okay. 1950. I'm thinking it was 52 because my, my sister was a baby. She was born in 52. Uh-huh. And immediately after that, they laid him off from Fort Gillum. Uh -huh. So he was hunting for a job, and he found a job within walking distance of our house. It was a welding shop, Blaylock's Welding. And it was on the old Gordon Road. Blaylock, there were two brothers, white, they, uh, naturally all the business was run by whites, mm -hmm. but um, one took a liking to him and the other one was just a staunch racist, hated him. Mm -hmm. But evidently the, the, the brother that liked him won out and they hired him on and started teaching him how to weld and they, I uh, guess, I don't know what they did, they just did welding repairs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, about... A year or so later, the good brother was killed in an auto accident. And you know what happened next when the bad brother was in charge, he was fired. So, Daddy just took his knowledge of welding and decided he would open his own shop. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the years of him digging a basement under our house from the crawl space and building an area down there. And he got a welder from the pawn shop from his old friend. Mr. Johnson that worked at the pawn shop on Peter Street, he got a welder. Mm -hmm. And his first, the first things he made were mailbox stands and garbage can holders. Because I remember us delivering them in the car. <laughs> Back in those days, you had the old galvanized steel metal garbage cans mm -hmm. and dogs would tip them over. So he made a little round device that stuck in the ground, decorative, that would hold your garbage can. And then the business started to grow, and he started doing wrought iron work, um, 
or drillings. That was about the time that he got involved with the civil rights suit, uh, well, the desegregation suit. Okay. I was going to Battle Hill Elementary School at the time. Battle Hill? Battle Hill. Where is that? Do you know, have you ever heard of Rosalie Wright Elementary School? It's on uh, Autumn Lane, over behind Westview Cemetery. We were still living there. Oh, okay. No, I think it's Larchwood Road curves around and there's a street called Autumn Lane. Now. Okay. Rosalie Wright was built on the grounds where Battle Hill originally was. Battle okay. Hill was a five-room schoolhouse. Um, outdoor bathrooms. We had the old coal-burning potbelly stoves because I remember we were assigned duties to go out and chop the wood and bring it in to keep the classroom. This was in the 50s. This was in the 50s. Okay. I was in the first, second, and third grade. I went to Battle Hill. And um, I remember when I graduated from the first grade to the second grade, I just moved from one side of the room to the other side of the room. <laughs> you had to have all seven grades in five rooms, so some right. of them had to double up. Uh -huh. uh, Do you remember your teachers? I was trying to remember. I remember Ms. Atkinson was my first grade teacher. Oh, gee. My third grade teacher was Miss Holt, Aura Holt. She was also the principal. Aura Holt. And I can't remember what was that second grade teacher's name. I can't remember her name, but she was the one that put my, my fear. When we started second grade, the first thing she announced was we were going to have to cut the erasers off our pencils because we were old enough to not make mistakes again. <laughs> You had to be perfect. Yeah. They condemned the school in, when I was in the third grade, so I'm thinking it was maybe 50, maybe I don't know what year. I don't remember the year. But they condemned the school because of the conditions. Mm -hmm. And I transferred to Frank L. Stanton over by Mosley Park. Okay. And Frank L. Stanton for the fourth and fifth grade while they built the new Rosalie Wright School on the grounds of Old Battle Hill. And I went back to Rosalie Wright for the 6th and 7th grade. Miss Ross taught me 6th and 7th grade, and Miss Post was the principal. Um, from the 7th grade, I started at Turner High School in 1960. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I should have mentioned that uh, when Daddy, when he first got involved with the suit, and since me being a child of his, um, I was originally supposed to be the first ones to integrate the schools and they had in order for us not to appear subpar or uneducated we went to school at the old Atlanta Teachers Union building I think it's at the corner of Ashby I know where that is we went to school there every to weekend get ready for integration, ready for integration. Um, and how did they get you ready um, basically, we just had classes, um, school Academic. history, academics, math, history, science. How many were there of you about? Jeez, I don't remember. I remember Mr. Putnam's daughter going. Um, initially, Sarah Bell, one of my classmates, was going. But Mr. Bell was a postman at the time. We considered him rich man in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I found out later on why the certain people dropped out of the lawsuit because he was threatened he they threatened him with his job if he continued. At the post office? The post office. Civil service? Yes. Most of the people um, that that were assignees were self employed. Mr. Winfrey had his construction company. I think Mr. Putnam was a plumber or an electrician or something, but if you go back and look at the assignees, you'll find out that most of them didn't hold public positions because they were, the jobs were threatened. You had to go to those who had some economic independence. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that was undercut because Daddy's business was growing, but when the newspaper released the names of the people who signed the suit, a lot of his, he had a lot of white business um, that just dried up, they just disappeared. Uh -huh. Now what's the year for this when... Uh... Uh, so I'm thinking this was... What grade were you in now? Seventh grade? Seventh grade. Okay, which means you would have been about 12 years old. Yes. 47, 57. 
by 59. That was when the... Yeah, because we moved in 61 outside the city. Uh-huh. Because the city started because of daddy's <coughs> business in the basement. Even though it was, you know, quite common back then, you know, you had your little, I remember Mr. Tillum's grocery store on the corner. Mm -hmm. You know, he lived upstairs and the store was downstairs. Mm -hmm. But the city started pressuring daddy about him having that business in his basement. Uh. And, um, and I don't know... We moved in 1961 outside the city to Adamsville. Okay. Where he could, he could still maintain his business and not have the city on it. Okay. What, before you move, though, what kinds of activities or what kinds of things do you recall in that whole preparation for desegregation? I think the scariest thing that I remember. Um, like I say, Dad had his business in the basement. And he had an old garage where he kept his truck for doing his work. Mm -hmm. And mom used to park. Mom worked for Maryland Baking Company on the night shift, making ice cream cones. What company was that? Maryland Baking Company. Maryland Baking. They made all of the ice cream cones. Okay. And mom, we, whenever we wanted a snack growing up, there was, <laughs> it was no ice cream. cream. <laughs> no ice cream, just the cone. <laughs> so to this day, I'm really not too You don't like cones. <laughs> Mom used to park her car in the front yard, and we just thought it was so Daddy could come and go with his business. But years later, I found out that because of all the threats that had been made against our family, every night for years, when we went to bed, Daddy would go and sleep in that car in the front yard with his shotgun. Wow. We never knew it. I didn't know it until Daddy started writing his memoirs. And found out about it. So I don't really know how long it went on. So what kind of pressure had made him do that? Well, I remember us, he told us never to answer the phone because of all of the calls from the Klan, from angry whites, and who knows what they said. But, um, because he would answer the phone. Yeah. The, yeah, the children were not to. The children were not allowed to answer the phone. What did you think at that point? Uh, I thought it was his business. I thought he just, you know, he also had his own business. And I don't know whether he actually told us that, but I just assumed it was because they would be business calls. And okay. He didn't want kids answering the phone. I got you. But um, later on I found out it was big more. It was just the, the, the threats against his life and against us. So let me see if I understand. Uh, you all were part of that first suit, mm -hmm. a court case that was filed right. to integrate the schools. Okay, so what was the what was the outcome? What, what or what was the first response to that the suit that you filed? The first response. Yeah, or um, when you were taking the classes uh, on Ashby Street, you all were assuming that you all would be going soon to a desegregated school. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I guess at that point, in 59, the school board had come up with at least a desegregation plan. The plan was, to me, to build more schools in the black neighborhood so that we would not have an excuse to go. You know, okay. The, the main purpose was we were, we had to pass by white schools to go to the nearest black school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're supposed to go to school in your neighborhood. That's the whole purpose of it. That's mm -hmm. what people buy homes now. Mm -hmm. It's because of the schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was just a rash of building, building, building. Like I say, they built Rosalie Wright. Um, and if, you, if you go back and look, you'll see that when I first started high school, basically there was Howard High, Turner High, Archer High, and Carver High. But then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they started just building, building, building schools in the black neighborhoods. That would be a way to still keep us contained. Mm -hmm. You weren't in Booker T. Washington's neighborhood for high school. No. Okay. What was your What was your high school in your neighborhood? Uh, the closest one was Turner High. That was at okay. Rosalie Park. Then. Ah, okay. That was the closest school. Okay. And I went there for 1960. I mean, yeah, 1960, eighth grade, ninth grade, and half of the tenth grade. So in 1963. 
they had completed Harper High. Uh -huh. Because see, we were living in Adamsville now, uh, outside the city. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I was supposed to be going to a county school, but I was still I continued to go to Turner. It was a long way to go in Virginia school. And okay. there were no buses, so, you know, I remember riding to work in the back of Daddy's pickup truck, okay. asking him to drop us off around the corner, you know. But, uh, <laughs> Um, and then, like I say, they built Harper, which at the time was when they for the first blacks started integrating the school. This was like 1962, 1963. Um, I had a close friend that went to Bass High. Okay. Who's, who was she? She was Portia. She was Portia Cox now. It was Portia Hardy back then. Okay. She lived um, near Turner High, but she went to Bass as part of the original blacks to go there. Uh -huh. But then Portia moved out to Adamsville across the street from me and when they built Harper, she went to Harper. She came to Harper in 63 also. Okay. How did your father feel? You all had been that initial suit against the school systems and so in a sense you were in line to be integrated first but then when you moved out uh, of the district, was your father still involved? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. He stayed involved. Um, how did he stay involved? How did he stay involved? In oh, I relationship? remember going to him going to NAACP meetings. Uh, they even had some meetings at our house once. Mm -hmm. um, but he yeah, he stayed he stayed involved because you know he grew up in times when there was just. I remember he told me a story once. My uncle, Uncle Charlie had gone to Detroit and had gotten a job working at the Ford plant and how, how great it was and he tried to get Dad to leave the South mm -hmm. and move to Detroit. Come on up here, things are better. Black people are treated better. You know, there's no racism up here. And I remember the trip. I was really young. Dad drove up. He and I drove up to Detroit and he just wanted to check out and see if it was worth relocating the entire family to Detroit. We came back, we never moved. Years later, I asked him, I said, Dad, what, you know, what was it about Detroit? I mean, Uncle Charlie wanted you to move up there, they were good jobs. And, and he said that he noticed that the only difference between the North and the South was in the South, you knew who your enemies were because they told you to your face. In the North, you didn't. They'd smile in your face and stab you in the back. He said, I would much rather know who hates me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> did not know. So he remained in the South. Mm -hmm. um, How did he happen to get you involved in the whole school desegregation? How how, how did he come to that, that, that Battle decision? Hill. Battle mm -hmm. Hill School. It was just a deplorable, rat infested school. Like I ah. say, it was, you know, we had five rooms. And, you know, though he Outdoor girls and outdoor boys' bathrooms. We had to go down this long hill, and if it rained, the hill was too muddy to go down. But it was just the conditions that we had, and he just felt that we deserved better. I'll never forget one of the things Daddy told me. He said that he was that this whole struggle, working with the NAACP, filing the suits, this whole struggle was for equality but we settled for, for integration, and that's not the same. We still don't have equality to this day. We integrated. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Yeah. But that was his thing. It was just, he just wanted to be treated equal. Uh, you know, he, the original, the original uh, segregation things were that we would be separate, separate but equal. But we were not equal. The school books that we even had, even at Turner High, were the ones that the white schools got rid of. So they would be missing pages, missing covers. That was the books that we used. And that's not equal. Why don't we get the new one? Just divide it up. If we're paying taxes, and it's supposed to go for even separate but equal education, if it's not equal, it's not fair. I, I feel like him. I. I really think that if we had stayed 
segregated, we would be a much more powerful force than we are now. How so? The, I remember the days of segregation where my dentist, you know, we had dentist office, the, the entire Auburn Avenue, the, the Ashby Hunter Street area, you know, those were thriving black businesses. And when, the, when we moved out to Adamsville and the, the building started, the Collier Heights area, where all the prominent black people started moving, and those were built by black contractors. Herman Russell was a very good friend of my father. He started out doing sheetrock, and then you know where his business is today. Mm -hmm. But then Daddy's business really started growing, started growing because now it's, I mean, he was doing well. But to me, segregation diluted. I mean, integration diluted us because look at look at the. I mean, we still have black businesses, but I just think that had we remained a sol a solid group, we could have grown more. It just diversified us, split the money up. Back then, everybody helped each other, and you you know that growing up, you could eat up the street, down the street now, most people don't even know who their neighbors are. Um, and like I say, I get that from him. It's just, all I've ever wanted is just to be treated, you know, well, fairly, responsibly. And to this day, 2006, right now, it's still stuff like that going on. You're just not. I know when um, I was laid off from my job, and I was searching for a job, I'm not saying that they were discriminating against me because of my color, but I know there were some job opportunities I thought I should have gotten, but they were, what's the excuse, you're overqualified, that's the excuse these days now. But anyway, back to that. Um, I want to hear more about the, just the, the, the segregation in those days, the Jim Crow, uh, what it was like. So. We know what the schools were like. What what else was happening? Uh, well, what 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 other things? What was it like? You know, I guess the only the only major department store that we were allowed to shop in was Rich's. Mm, okay. And but then Rich's had a policy because you couldn't try on the clothes. You know, even if you bought them and took them on and they were too large or too small, they're mm -hmm. still yours. Mm -hmm. they are not um, that. And, and the thing about it is, is growing up. You know, I guess our family were, we were, you kind of, you just figure that's the way things are. You don't feel like you're being denied any rights. Now, Daddy felt it because he grew up in it and he was an adult. That's like I feel it now. But back then, that was just the way things were. And how much interaction would you have had with white people anyway? Um, I met a lot of them when Daddy's business was going, was started out doing well. Okay. They were his customers, but then, like I said, once they found him, found out that he was one of the signees mm -hmm. of the suit, those people stopped coming around. Mm -hmm. One or two of them, Mr. Tatum, I mean, Mr. Tatum remained a friend of Daddy's until mm -hmm. he passed. Um, I don't really remember. I remember Daddy did some work for him, and they just became good friends. Mm -hmm. What about church? What church did you all go to? Big Bethel. Big Bethel. Big Bethel. Bethel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bishop Beard. The whole family joined at the same time. Uh huh. Um, and you know they were big. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mr. Mr. Hill, Jesse Hill, from Big Brother. Uh huh. A lot of people there. Daddy made a lot of business acquaintances there. Okay. But you know, Daddy's business, like I say, when, when it started really growing. Uh huh. Um, I had gotten a job then, and I was working. What year is this? I guess we we're in the late 60s now. Okay. I finished high school. I got a job right out of high school as a draftsman at the Western Electric. Uh-huh. And um, Daddy had so much business that he was just, just turning it down. And I said, why don't you hire someone? He's doing all this by himself. Mm -hmm. so I said, Daddy, you could just make so much money. <laughs> all you need is you. Get you some people to work for you, do your welding, and you can do all the design. And he was doing burglar bars, burglar doors. If you ride through southwest Atlanta now, 
90% of that work was done by Danny in the 60s and 70s. Um, but he told me something, and I thought it was crazy at the time. He said, all I ever wanted in life was a roof over my head, food on the table, and a boat to go fishing in. He said, I got all three of them. I'm not going to be greedy. And he says, plus, more money means more headaches. As long as I have what I prayed for, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way he remained. Yeah. What were his dreams for you? He was very proud of me when I got the job. Um, uh, you know, that's he worked for a big company, Western Electric, which eventually became AT&T. Okay. And he was very proud. And because I was doing something that is it's, it's strange, Daddy had two passions, mm -hmm. fishing, which I hate. Mm -hmm. He and my brother went fishing all the time, but I just passed. But anytime something was broken, you know, we added a room onto the house. We worked on the cars together. That was our time together. We were always mechanically doing stuff. And, and when I got a job doing what I really love to do, he says, you just don't know how lucky you are. He says, you realize it because then it's not a job anymore. It's a passion. It's something that I really like to do. And he was proud of me that, you know, I, that I actually what happened was they came, Western Electric, Previous, the year before I graduated, one of our students had gone on to work there, and they were impressed by the training that the guy had had as far as drafting was concerned. And they came out and talked with my teacher, Eddie Peters. And they said, we like your method, the methods of training. So they kept an eye on the, asking who the top people were in the next class, and I happened to be one of them. There's two people. You ever heard of William Stanley? Billy Stanley? Bill Stanley? 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 Oh, yes. We went to school together. Billy and I went to drafting class together. Okay. Billy, as a matter of fact, when Billy graduated, he got a job at Western Electric. Mm -hmm. But he worked there for the summer, and he had been accepted to Georgia Tech. So he left and went, went to Georgia Tech. Okay. Billy and I are good friends. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but we still remain good. We used to carpool together, going to work. Okay. Um, but Daddy was proud of that, and, um, and I was that that I was doing something that I liked and he was very proud of me. Mm -hmm. um, after about, I thought I'd been there maybe eight years or something, started getting bored with the corporate and all of that. And I went to him and I said, what do you think about maybe me coming in and working with you and learning your skills? And he told me, no, you have, you, you have a retirement to look forward to, you've got a good foothold, you know your job. He says, you don't want this. Another, another, another one of the things that happened with when people found out Daddy was involved with that, his suppliers. You know, he had to buy steel, he had to buy welding rods, he had acetylene torch, all this equipment. People, they wouldn't just not sell it to him. What they started doing were putting minimum orders. If Daddy had a job and he needed, oh, 15 square feet of steel, they said, no, you have to buy 100. They wouldn't let him just buy enough to do that particular job and then come back in the next. Um, the people that um, Daddy hated Sears. He had bought a new welder from Sears. And something was wrong with it. And they wouldn't let him return it. It was just a way of brushing him off. And he never shot the All while this out. was going on. All while this was going on. Okay. This was just a little, you know, they knew they, they could pop, they could get in trouble for just flat out. And this was in the 60s. Had his picture been in the paper? His name had been in the paper? He was, he was in Jet magazine. I don't know about the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Mama still has that Jet of mm -hmm. them sitting with, uh, who was the lawyer? A lawyer from D.C. that came down. Hall, not Hallwell. I can't remember his name. But Mom still has that jet, and I think it's dated. It's dated back in the 50s when they were having their meetings. Mm. Might have been Thurgood Marshall. Yeah, could have been. Mm. Could have been. There was a lady also involved. Uh, Motley? Constance? Marion Motley. Constance Baker Motley? Constance Baker Motley. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you all worked with the very best. Mm-hmm. Um, where was I? Well, 
I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit more about uh, the working with the NAACP and then the effect. I had asked you about his his name being in the in the paper. I was trying to trace and track the community's negative response once they knew that he was one of the yeah, how I many was nine parents. Yeah, um, you know a lot of the a lot of the parents dropped out when they were threatened with the jobs. And do you recall their names? Mr. Bell, I can't remember his first name. Uh -huh. Mr. Bell, he had a bunch of girls uh -huh. on the corner. Uh -huh. um, well, see, you know, Daddy, Daddy was secretive. He didn't, he, you know, he didn't tell us a lot of stuff until later, way, way, way later uh -huh. on. Uh -huh. um, I guess basically protect us and not have us living in fear. Uh -huh. So we were, like I said, I wasn't even aware of the threats uh -huh. against us. Uh -huh. um, I do remember we went on one of the few fishing trips I went on. This was a whole family. It was me and my brother and sister. We went on a fishing trip to Altoona. And all of a sudden, Daddy just told us to hop in the truck. He all of a sudden what? He just told us to jump in the truck. It's time to go. And we were like, what? Oh, I haven't been here that long. The clan was there. Wow. And I remember, and, said, and just to show how, how sheltered he kept us, I didn't even know they were the clan. I was wondering who these people were with those white sheets. And why are you trying to run over them? But we were getting out of, you know, Altoona was up at work. That was strictly playing country. And I guess we were up there just fishing and they saw us and Daddy figured we better hightail it over. Mm. it out of there. Because they were blocking the road, I remember. And we were uh, They were having some kind of a rally? I don't know what they were having, but I guess when they saw us. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I don't know whether they knew who Daddy was at that time or what, but he just knew that uh -huh. we need to get out of here. Uh -huh. Was there at any time when your mother felt that he should withdraw from the struggle? If it was, we didn't know about it. Okay. They didn't tell us. Okay. You was know, uh, you're talking about that, about Daddy and Mother. I never heard them raise their voice in my entire life. I remember mom crying one time and she thought I was asleep. And it was because daddy had, it was Christmas Eve, and daddy had gone back to our old neighborhood. He had a bunch of friends. Daddy didn't drink, didn't smoke, but he just wanted to hang out with his old buddies because we were basically out in the country when we moved to Adamsville. And he had gone back to the old neighborhood just to hang out with his buddies for a little while. And the Christmas gifts were hidden in the trunk of the car. And daddy got back too late. <laughs> you know, so they had to hurt, stay up all night long to put Christmas out. But uh, mm -hmm. that's the only time I ever heard. You know, like I say, it's when I, I talk to friends and they talk about their parents fussing and fighting stuff. So I never heard anything like that. They never, ever, they were always the perfect couple. So if there were any disagreements, mm -hmm. I never knew. Were your younger S siblings, did they continue at segregated schools? Um, no, let's see. My sister and brother went. They went. They started and went to West Fulton High School. Because by then, Harper was overcrowded, so we okay. had to go to them. By then, the schools were desegregated. And so, West Fulton's uh, black population would have been what? Uh, there were a lot of white students still there, okay. but I say it was about. I say it was about fifty fifty. Okay. And this was, I remember because I was working and I would drop them off at school every morning. So this was like 1966, 67. What was their experience going to an integrated school? How did they feel about it? I didn't hear any complaints. So okay. I'm pretty sure there was a lot of stuff that went on, but not long, well, in 1967 I was drafted and I went away for two years. Okay. And I didn't get to see either one of them graduate because they both got mom sent me graduation pictures when okay. I was overseas. But, uh -huh. um, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. They, I they imagine by the time they graduated, the school was largely black. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um,
tell me a little bit more about what it was like growing up in Atlanta. You said that you're, you and your father were very interested in baseball. Yeah. So how did you, how did you pursue that interest? Um, it's funny because we never had a TV, so we always just the baseball games on the radio. My grandma, grandma, grandmother moved in with us. She lived over in Dixie Hills, and I think when they built the Dixie Hills apartment complex, they bought up. She lived on Wadley Street. Never forget that house, one of those old shotgun houses, you know. I think it was a duplex. And she had a, um, a stove, you know, where you Open up the eyes and put the wood down, keep the fire going. Um, by the end, there was only Uncle Pete left. Uncle James, my father had a brother, Uncle James, stayed in trouble. Always, the police were always dead ahead to go bail him out. So finally, the police gave him an option to just leave town. Or they were going to lock him up for good. So he left. Daddy bought him a bus ticket to go to Detroit to live with Uncle Charlie. He never made it there. We never heard from him since. To this day, nobody knows what happened Uncle Daddy. Daddy tried to find him, but we don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. But um, growing up back then, we, we had a really happy childhood. You know, basically, I think because they shielded us from a lot of that stuff. Um, and in those years, going to the Fox Theater, and we knew you'd go up, you buy your ticket, then you'd go back around and go down the side and go up the steps, and you could only sit upstairs. That was just the way it was. What did you see at the Fox? Uh, first movie I ever saw at the Fox, Goldfinger. Wow. And we were still sitting upstairs time? in those days. That was 1965. Okay. You know, um, what about the baseball games? Where did you go for baseball? Um, first baseball game I went to was in Cincinnati, Ohio. My hometown. Really? Went to see the Cincinnati Redlegs. Okay. Um, Mama had a sister that lived there. And we went up to visit one year. That was okay. my first real live baseball game. And, you know, we didn't have the Braves. We only had the Atlanta Crackers. And black people weren't allowed to go there. Right. So. What about the black leagues? They didn't ever play in Atlanta? Okay. I don't remember playing here. Okay. I'm pretty sure we would have gone to see them if they played here, but I don't remember going to see them. Yeah. No. Um, Daddy, used to, Daddy, Daddy used to play baseball. Um, he wanted to be a member of the black baseball team, but oh, I um, see. hardship on the family. Daddy, had to, Daddy was going to Washington High and he had to drop out in the ninth grade to get a job to help the family. My grandmother. It was a depression. Yeah. He had to drop out of school, so he never got, he never got past a ninth grade education, but he was very, very, very smart. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the thing about this growing up, you just don't realize how smart they are until you become an adult and you say, Wow. <laughs> he knew a whole lot of stuff back then. And yeah. how hard it is to know that much. Yes, yeah. yeah. Things that now you know, he's been gone almost ten years and um, things that he told me, and I took his advice simply because, you know, I knew that he was right, but mm -hmm. not knowing the underlying things that he knew. Now mm -hmm. I see why he told me to do this. Now I see the real reason he said to do this. Mm -hmm. um, a smart man, very smart man, quiet, had a temper. Mm -hmm. And like I say, it's, um, we, unfortunately, one of the things I inherited from him was the ability to forgive but never forget. So we do have a tendency to hold a grudge sometimes. We'll forgive, but I'm not going to forget. You had mentioned your friend that had gone to Bass, yeah. one of the first to go to Bass. Did she share with you any, any experiences that she had? It must have been, at times, an ordeal be the, among the first mm -hmm. in an all-white situation, no? She didn't like it, I remember. When 
she moved across the street from me, uh -huh. and we would sit out on the steps and talk. Um, we subject never really came up that much about it. I think I remember asking her what was it like going there, and she said she made a few friends, but most uh -huh. of them were just mean. Uh -huh. She was glad when they finished Harper and she could go to school with her people, her people her again. So yeah. she then resegregated herself. Yeah. Okay. Well, seeing now how Atlanta is basically resegregated, uh, what's your assessment of that whole effort and where, what impact it had on us and where we are now? Mm. Well, like I say, I still don't believe that we are being treated equally. Uh -huh. um, I have friends one of my co-workers, he moved down from New York. Mm -hmm. He had always lived in this integrated society, Poughkeepsie, New York, and he came down and the first thing he did was he bought a house in an all-white neighborhood because he was more comfortable. You know, the image of massive blacks, you know how the news treats us. With it's scared. Yeah, scared, scared. Um, and as soon as he moved in, you know, the for sale sign started going up. And he was like, what's wrong with these people? What, I mean, they're all moving. And I said, you're in the South now. You know, there is still racism here. You move in, they move out. And he did that twice. As, as soon as the neighborhoods became all black, he moved. They moved out again. And he couldn't understand why. He said, my neighbors won't speak to me. And I said, you know, I would much rather have a neighbor that I know has got my back than somebody who wouldn't, who wouldn't care about me at all. I live in an all-black neighborhood, and I can tell when he comes to visit. I can see, you know, he's like, he unlock your door. And I'm like, for what? I'm here. I lock it when I'm not here, but mm -hmm. nobody's gonna run up and, like you see on the news, the the home invasion people. Mm -hmm. They have a, t uh, it, you know, it's just the image that I really don't like that's projected mm -hmm. about my people. Mm -hmm. We, and unfortunately. It's, it's kind of like we've been socially programmed. I talked, my son who's 34 now, one of the things I talked to him about was what, it, what they do is this image that they project that we are, if you tell a person that they're that way long enough, mm -hmm. you're going to get them to start, most of them to start believing that that's the way mm -hmm. they are. Back when we were segregated and you had the black families raising the people and we didn't have the TV and the media. As a matter of fact, I remember my reading the newspaper where they would have the colored deaths, you know, on the other page. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, we weren't the headlines back then. And you had, the family had roots and you, the parents could actually raise the children. Now TV raises children, and TV is just full of nothing but violence mm -hmm. and antisocial behavior. Mm -hmm. And I was telling my son, I said, social programming, you know, if, if you have a child and you tell that child, if you call that child a dummy from the time he's a baby, mm -hmm. that's what he's going to grow up to be, mm -hmm. is a dummy. And that's basically what, I don't watch the news that much, I read the newspaper from front to back every every day. Mm -hmm. But with the newspaper, as soon as I start reading it, I can, I can see where this story is going, I can just move on to something else. It's not like with the news where you're going to have to sit there through it and wait to see what they're going to tell you about next. Wait for the weather. Or wait for, me for any national news. And that's, and that's one of my main things that I hate today. My friends say, you know, you're just a racist. And I say, yeah, I am. I am. Because I, I am upset the fact that they diversified us to the point that now it's like a story I heard once that the plantation owners, when they started fearing that there were way too many slaves and one day they could someday just overpower the plantation owner and, and get away. What they did was they diversified and they split them up. They put the light skin ones working in the house, the dark skin ones working in the fields. And that created aggression between those two groups. Mm -hmm. Spike Lee's movement was about the same thing. Mm -hmm. But 
what you do is you get them fighting amongst themselves and they forget about what you do. Advancement or coming together. The same co-worker I was telling you about. I worked with some Russians and they had a policy whenever a new Russian family came to Atlanta, all of the existing Russian families would each contribute $10,000 to that family to help them get started on their feet and then they would join that group and when the next family comes, the same thing. The guy that moved down says, that's crazy, you'll never see that money again. They're not going to pay you back. That's foolish. And I said, you know, that's the problem with us. We're like crabs in a barrel. As soon as the crab gets near the top, one of the bottom will reach up and put them back down. Instead of us helping each other mm -hmm. and growing, we're just too busy trying to knock each other down. Well, right now, we have a situation where uh, basically, the schools have been resegregated. Mm -hmm. Blacks are basically in control of the public school system. Um, so, how do you assess that? What does that mean? We, it is segregation again. Most, you know, it's it's pretty much all black. Yeah, um, it is. Blacks are in control, uh, and yet quality of education is seriously you know, questioned, is in doubt. Um, well, going back to what I said about the kids now, they, they the, the, the drive to be somebody, to not, not be a rapper, but to get educated and become a, a part of society that you can look up to, that you can what am I trying to say? Um, there's, there's, there's no cohesiveness. You know, one of the things I really I have these these beliefs that Martin Luther King was assassinated because he had us all working as a group. No one has come along since that day that everyone would listen to. If he said, okay, I want all you people to invest in this, they would have done it back then. There's no cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. um, getting back to your school question. Mm -hmm. I think, I think not only in just, just in the school system, but right now we have people who are in position to make change, not concerned about change, all they're concerned about is themselves and the money they <clears throat> um, you know, when the first blacks started, I remember Leroy Johnson, he was first elected, he actually did good work and he tried to make changes that would help black people and show us that we can have, we can benefit from the government. But now, all you see is bribery here, corruption there, they're forgetting. They're forgetting that it's supposed to be about the people. That black people, including us black people. Now we finally have black people in charge. This should be the time that we should be growing by leaps and bounds. Instead, we're going in the opposite direction. I wish I knew the answer to how to fix it, but you are so right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this, what's going to happen. Yeah. That's um, it's a very harsh reality. I was looking at this when Sandy Springs became a city. Now they have two more places that want to come cities. I think that what they're going to do is just pull away and just leave Atlanta out there to mm -hmm. And if we don't turn around and start doing something about it, it's, it's going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. We're not even going to be mm -hmm. the capital anymore. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I have a final question. What do you think your father would say about what's going on now? Your father died when? 1997. 97, okay, not so long ago. So you had a chance to hear his assessment of where we are. And after he had Basically gone through what he'd gone through, yeah. struggled as he had, uh, so what what would he have to say today about? Well, like I say, he was disappointed. He was disappointed that what all he went through, that the solution was integration, and that wasn't really what the problem was. Integration only was, was a false, a way of settling the matter. 
What would he say now? Um, I think I'd probably hear him curse for the first time in his life. Mm -hmm. Because he, he, daddy always supported other black people. You know how once, once a person supposedly moves up in the ladder, oh well, I have a white doctor, or my pharmacist, or my, my accountant. And to see the daddy were alive now, to see that we are fighting amongst ourselves instead of trying to grow as a society and become a force, just like the foreigners have come in here and what they do is they stick together. You look at all the businesses that they now control, you can't go to a Dairy Queen without a Pakistani behind the counter. And I, I feel that if black people would just stop bickering amongst each other and, and try to work together as a group of black Americans, but I don't know, it's probably going to take another 100, 100 years, mm -hmm. 200 years if we're still around. Mm -hmm. To realize that we have to, we have to depend on each other. We can't depend on someone else to do it for us. Simply because they pass a law, that doesn't make everything right. Well said. Thank you, Thank you very much. You're a very good interview.